The main reason why I wanted to make this video was because when starting my physiotherapy journey, I felt and still feel a lot of imposter syndrome. I felt overwhelmed by the, the sheer number of skills that I need to work on. But the question is, which skills, which areas of physiotherapy should take priority? Because I think it's sometimes possible to lose sight of the core foundational skills of what makes a good physiotherapist. And I didn't want to be one of those physiotherapists that has a lot of random clinical knowledge, but doesn't have the skills and awareness to apply those clinical knowledge, to apply that clinical knowledge in such a way that it actually helps patients. Throughout my experience of treating patients in a musculoskeletal or MSK outpatient setting, I've seen a variety of different physiotherapists. Each one having their own levels of experience, levels of competence, and their own philosophies behind why they treat the patients in the way that they do. Before I started my degree, I had a rough idea of what skills a MSK physiotherapist needs. But now I have a much clearer understanding of what skills are necessary to become a great MSK physio, even if I don't have all those skills currently myself. So in this video, I want to talk about those very skills why I think they're important, where in my journey I think I'll need them, in the hopes that it kind of gives guidance to those who are watching the video. So I'm going to split the video into three levels. Each level represents a different period within a physiotherapist time frame and what skills I think a physiotherapist should or could have within that, that time period. Or at least this is what I aim for once I graduate. But just to make things crystal clear as a disclaimer, I am not qualified yet but i will be in a few months so therefore this video is not meant to be specific medical advice for how to treat a specific medical condition in general it's just about the generic skills i think that physiotherapists should have but in general if you're unsure about anything clinical always clarify and speak to a medical professional before you do anything okay with all that legal stuff out of the way i shouldn't get into trouble with the hcpc when I think of level one, I think of someone who is close to finishing the, their degree or is a postgraduate or a recent postgraduate. When I think of level two, I think of someone who's been working in the industry for at least a year or two. And lastly, level three is someone who's been working as an MSK physio for five, 10, or even 20 or more years. The reason why that range is intentionally long is because people progress in their career at different rates due to various different factors but logically each level builds upon the last. So after graduation, there's multiple skills that you need to practice safely and effectively as an MSK physiotherapist. When I think of one of the most common foundational skills that a physiotherapist needs, it's the knowledge of human anatomy. So this means knowing all the different muscles that we use for sporting activities or for day-to-day -day activities, knowing the different bones, because ultimately it's the muscle slash tendons pulling on those bones that enables movement, knowing the main ligaments within the main synovial joints, such as knees and shoulders, because it's those ligaments that provide stability at the joint. Also having good neuromuscular anatomy is important. So knowing uh, myotomes, dermatomes, reflexes, and knowing what nerve roots or what nerves that exit each nerve root innervate a certain area of skin or innervate a certain muscle. I think it's also important to know um, the main arteries and veins in the body, but at a very basic level. Knowing these things should be the bedrock of your clinical knowledge. If you don't have a good grasp of anatomy, your clinical reasoning will suffer. For example, when reading a referral, if a, if a doctor says that a patient has fractured the left medial condyle of tibia or whatever, would you be able to point that out? Where is that? Do you know where it is on the body? Before I started my physiotherapy degree, I wasted loads of time revising anatomy and physiology in just pointless and time consuming ways. So if you wanna learn my techniques for how I revise anatomy and physiology, then let me know and I'm happy to do a video on that. In a nutshell, biomechanics is the study of movement in humans, but from a mechanical point of view. To mention some of the main topics that come to mind in biomechanics, the stuff that comes to mind is kinetics, kinematics, gait analysis and joint mechanics. 
if I were to test people's knowledge in relation to these subjects, I would be asking things like, um, what is the difference between a first, second and a third class lever? What are the working definitions of radius, fulcrum and mechanical disadvantage? What planes of motion can a joint move in? What movements can a joint slash muscle enable? What is the name of that specific movement? For example, what is dorsiflexion? What is adduction or abduction? What is circumduction? What is a normal range of motion approximately for each joint for each specific movement? Those are just some questions just to kind of get your brain thinking uh, if you're thinking about how biomechanics applies to MSK physiotherapy. But this knowledge is very important because ultimately physiotherapy is the study of, it's not, it's not specifically this, but a huge part of physiotherapy is movement, knowing looking into how patients move, is the type of movement causing their pain? Is their pain causing their movements? As in, are they changing the movement patterns because of their pain? Are they moving in a certain way because they're weak? Can we use movement to therefore be also a type of treatment as well as assessment? Movement is a huge part of what it means to be a physiotherapist and knowing about movement, why it's important and what and how the particular way a patient moves is important or not important. Ultimately, because knowledge of biomechanics allows you to have a much greater awareness of how the body moves, you have a much greater understanding of the implications of how moving in a certain way will affect the body. Also, since biomechanics teaches you a lot of the principles about physics, such as mechanical um, advantage, it allows you to modify and adapt exercises to make them easier or harder if you know the principles of biomechanics. The twin sister to anatomy is physiology. And physiology is a study of the functions that keep us alive and the mechanisms of those functions. More specifically, it's how organs, tissues, cells carry out these functions. Physiological knowledge of the mechanisms within the musculoskeletal system are so important. If you don't understand physiology, you won't really understand how the musculoskeletal system can, in, can heal itself from injury. You won't understand how muscles contract from a cellular point of view. You won't understand how the body adapts to exercise. How signals travel from your brain slash spinal cord to areas of the body, allowing you to move and to sense things around you. Just knowing anatomy is like looking at the body when it's frozen in time. You can really only kind of point out certain structures. Don't get me wrong, it's still important, but biomechanics and physiology allows you to look at the body from an interactive, cohesive whole. You understand how that organ keeps you alive or how that cell communicates with that cell. One of the key skills that comes up time and time again in MSK physiotherapy job hostings is communication skills and team working skills. Well, why is this? The reason is because as a person, we have health needs and health is very complex. Therefore, we have multiple different health needs. Therefore, we need many different types of practitioners to, to treat us and to try and improve our health. It's impossible for just, because the body is so complex, it's impossible for just one person to know everything about health. And we've realized over the past few decades that the collaboration and cohesion of these different health practitioners is vital if we're gonna treat patients in the best way that, um, that we can. This means that your ability to communicate with other staff with the aim of achieving better prognosis for patients is vital. But on the other, on the other side of the coin, it's also about your communication with patients. I've come to realize that your ability to communicate with patients is just as important as your clinical knowledge. For example, if you don't ask patients the right questions and you don't listen to them, then your clinical reasoning is going to suffer. Therefore, you're going to struggle to come to a correct clinical hypothesis about why the patient is having their problems. For example, if you don't pay attention to the fact that the patient had a really increased amount of volume in regards to movement when they were moving house last week or a few weeks ago, then you probably might not come to the conclusion that their, their problem is likely to be a rotator cuff tendinopathy of the shoulder. Considering the majority of clinical hypotheses can be correctly identified and the fact that diagnoses, are, I, think, I think it's just something crazy, like the majority of diagnoses can be identified or made purely from the subjective assessment before you, you even touch the patient, 
shows how vital your communication skills within the subjective assessment is. Communication is also really important with treatment as a physiotherapist. Firstly, because if you don't listen to the patient and you don't listen to their preferences and what they want at, to get out of physiotherapy, then your treatment plan is less likely to be specific to the patient and therefore the patient is going to have a reduced sense of autonomy and therefore they're less likely to adhere to your treatment plan. Secondly, if you don't have the communication skills to make the patient feel like they're being listened to, and that you actually care about them and to show them you understand what you are talking about, then this is gonna limit the patient's ability to get better. Interestingly, evidence suggests that the likelihood of the patient's prognosis being better, or in other words, the likelihood that the patient will just get better in the end, is more to do with how the patient feels about the physiotherapist treating them rather than the efficacy or the effectiveness of the treatment that the physiotherapist has prescribed. Just let that sink in for a second. As a physiotherapist, you're gonna be seeing patients who are injured or have some kind of physical dysfunction. Therefore, knowing about the, the different conditions that will crop up systemically or through each joint, how to assess for them and how to treat them forms the bedrock of your clinical reasoning. It's generally useful to know what the most common conditions are for each joint whether it's osteoarthritis, tendinopathy, or bursitis. This is also where your knowledge of anatomy, biomechanics, and physiology comes in, because you can picture how that condition or injury will affect the patient from a functional point of view. To assess the patient, you'll first need to conduct a subjective assessment, asking about stuff like presenting problem, history of presenting problem, family history, social history, medical history, etc. Then based on this, you will then form your clinical hypothesis that you'll try to test in your objective assessment. So for the objective assessment, I'm thinking of stuff like observation, then palpation, then active range of motion, then passive range of motion, etc. Assuming you've done all of the above correctly, you then need to have an idea of what the most eff efficacious treatments are to treat that condition based on the scientific evidence. So is it manual therapy? Is it lifestyle modification? Is it exercise prescription? Specifically with exercise, it's good to have a rough idea of what exercises are useful for certain conditions. And also specifically, can you regress or progress those exercises? Because when you give an exercise, that exercise might not be fit for purpose in, in regards to the patient's function. So for example, if you were to prescribe a basic squat variation movement or exercise, could you regress, as in make it easier, or progress, make it harder, so it suits the patient's level of function? Or for whatever reason, a patient might not want to do the exercise in that way because that position might really hurt. So can you modify the exercise to suit, to suit, to, so, the, so the exercise suits the patient better? Your adaptability in this way is really important. Unfortunately, I've come to realize that not everything in physiotherapy from a scientific point of view is as evidence-based as it could be. So therefore, you really have to do some digging into the mechanism to kind of justify your clinical reasoning in certain situations. But if all else fails, NICE guidelines and other um, types of guidelines do give guidance in multiple areas of clinical practice. Something that I haven't mentioned yet in the script of this video, but I really wanted to mention it because it's really important. It's approaching a patient from a biopsychosocial, so from a biological, social, and psychological point of view. Because we know that pain is, is not mechanical. The, 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 the old model of healthcare was what's called the biomedical model, where you looked at the patient like they were some kind of robot slash machine, and when the machine's broken or faulty, you fix it but a person is not a machine. You don't get a screwdriver and tighten off some nuts and bolts and suddenly the, the patient's fine. That's not how it works. We have a brain, we have psychological needs, we have social needs, and we know now that all of these very much impact pain and function. So looking at um, the biopsychosocial model, definitely look into that and look into how that relates to how to treat patients. So, red flags. This is one of the most important areas to know as a physiotherapist to practice as a safe, autonomous practitioner. Red flags are essentially signs and symptoms related to sinister pathologies that are not within your scope of practice to be treating. In other words, someone else should be treating the patient with that um, pathology. Common examples of red flags in MSK physiotherapy are cordoraquina syndrome, 
um, DVTs, cervical arterial dysfunction, fractures, cancer, infections, stuff like that. It's vital you know what these are, what the patient will present with if they have these red flags, and, and then what you need to do if you think a patient has one of these red flags. If a patient has signs of a red flag but you're not quite sure, or if a patient has a condition that you're not aware of, you need to know in the back of your mind what you would do and who you would speak to. As a quick side note that I've just remembered, different clinics and hospitals and countries will have different protocols when it comes to dealing with patients who have certain red flags. So definitely look at what the protocols are for the place where you are working or you're on placement at. One of the things that isn't really talked about is your ability to interpret the scientific literature. In a way, I don't really blame people for not wanting to talk about this because for some people they do find it boring, which I partly understand. But as a physiotherapist, you need to keep up to date with the latest scientific evidence in regards to assessment and treatment so you're treating patients in the most effective way you can. And your ability to come to the conclusion about whether something is clinically justified in, in, in the sense of assessment and treatment is your, ability, is your scientific literacy, your ability to interpret the scientific literature. Because while guidelines given to you by national clinical governing bodies are like NICE guidelines, while they're useful, they're not always up to date. Sometimes they might get things wrong because science progresses and is not, and, and our discoveries are not the absolute truth for forever. And also there's not always a lot of evidence behind some of the, some of the recommendations within NICE guidelines, but not just NICE, it could be ACSM guidelines, for example. Therefore, it's important to take responsibility as an autonomous healthcare practitioner and to use your initiative and come and try and find your own conclusions based on the data. I appreciate though that interpreting the scientific literature is a huge complex topic. So if you want me to make more videos on this in the future, then please let me know. As a quick side note, there are other areas that a, a physiotherapist I think should at least have some basic awareness of when they're first starting out. The first one is a basic awareness of other bodily systems. Another thing is pharmacology. So what are the most, what are the common medications for someone with diabetes or who has a blood pressure issue? You won't be prescribing these things, but having a basic awareness of the names of these medications, and potentially how they affect the body is really important. For example, certain blood pressure medications could cause a patient to feel lightheaded when they get up too quickly, or certain steroid medications could cause a patient to have reduced healing time. As I said before, I think a general awareness is fine, but knowing about the different medications and different conditions outside of MSK physiotherapy will give you more awareness about the patient and patient and their level of function. Also, I think lastly, it's also good to have a, a rough awareness of the different MSK sur or orthopedic surgeries a patient will go through. So knowing what the name of the surgery is, is it a arthroscopy, laparoscopy, uh, is it an RF, for example? Is it a joint replacement? Thinking about, okay, well, what is the aim of that surgery and how will that surgery affect the patient's function a day later, a week later, a month later? Because you, you will probably be seeing some patients post-surgery. So at level two, an MSK physiotherapist should have a deeper understanding of the MSK system. They should have refined clinical reasoning and sharper treatment skills. At this point, I'm personally gonna aim for a much greater understanding of anatomy, physiology, and biomechanics. Hopefully, I'm more confident with the anatomy of all the joints of the body in a very detailed way. Hopefully, I can point out pretty much all the bony landmarks and I have a good awareness of the origins and insertions of each muscle. But as a quick hint though, the bony landmarks are essentially where the origins and insertions are for each muscle. Hopefully, I have a greater awareness of neuromuscular anatomy, um, such as nerve plexuses. I will also be looking into these topics into more niche and specific areas, so paediatrics, frailty or sport, for example. Again, these areas make up the foundation of your clinical reasoning, so it's important to always be developing and improving within these areas. Once patients get more experience, they refer to something called pattern recognition, which, and they state the best way to get pattern recognition is what they call patient mileage which is essentially the total number of patients that you've seen. I've mentioned before on this channel that our minds are very good at recognizing patterns. This also applies to MSK physiotherapy because 
if a patient has a certain condition, regardless of who it is, they are usually likely to, to have a certain kind of sign or symptom. This makes sense because it is through these signs and symptoms that allows you to identify so the, the pathology or injury in the first place. Therefore, if you treat enough patients, I haven't had this experience yet, but after a, few, after a year or two at least of uh, being a physiotherapist, you start to have a rough idea of what a patella tendinopathy patient looks like, what a hip osteoarthritis patient looks like, what a frozen shoulder patient looks like. As you can imagine, being able to recognize these patterns a lot sooner allows you to diagnose patients faster and more effectively. To kind of speed up this process of a pattern recognition, I plan to constantly be reading up on these conditions so I know what the usual clinical presentation is and I'll be reflecting on the patients that I've treated. Similar to pattern recognition, you might also have your own preferences in regards to how you treat patients. The effectiveness of a treatment protocol is ultimately dictated by how well you can carry out that treatment treatment protocol. Therefore, you might have your own preferences for what special tests you do, what kind of treatments you do, or maybe even your specific handling, the way you handle a patient's shoulder or arm when you're doing an assessment, for example. Around this time, you might have your first taste of teaching postgraduates the skills you've learned over the past couple years. And these physios will have the exact same concerns as any other postgraduate. By developing your educational and leadership skills, you have the opportunity to help these uh, physiotherapists and to be a good role model to them. At this level of physiotherapy practice, it becomes a lot harder to mention the, the specific skills that a, a expert or like should I say an experienced um, clinical MSK physio should have because you can subspecialize into so many different areas. So assuming a, a, an experienced or seasoned practitioner has all the other skills I've mentioned so far, I'm going to be mentioning the skills that I've noticed senior clinicians have from my point of view. At this level of MSK physiotherapy practice, you would have been doing it for a long time and you should be a highly experienced and clinically knowledgeable practitioner, as well as a leader, an educator, and just an advocate for the profession. I believe in this part of a physiotherapist's career, they should be very comfortable with interpreting the scientific literature for the reasons I've mentioned before. Maybe they've even used their knowledge to contribute towards research in the scientific field or improve healthcare policy to some degree. At this point, many different physios and staff might come to you for guidance, whereby you might be responsible for managing a whole team of different physios. While this is most definitely outside my realm of expertise, I've noticed some really good clinical physios will do a few things to help manage different staff. I've noticed that they will check on on other physios regularly, they will address their concerns, and they will bring out the full potential in every single physio that they are supporting. Regardless of whether a physiotherapist specializes or not, they will likely be very comfortable with a huge variety of a different assessment and treatment modalities. They will also have a very good level of experience and knowledge with treating more rarer conditions based on due to their levels, their years of experience. I would also imagine that they have their finger on the pulse, as it were, to the cutting edge knowledge of different areas of clinical practice. So while that wraps up level two and three, as you can tell, it was a lot shorter than level one because logically I'm not at that level yet. But even though I'm a student, I think it's really good to picture what physiotherapists look like at that level of expertise so I can aim for that level of skill in a much more conscientious way. In other words, my efforts are not being put towards developing random skills that a physiotherapist does not need at that point in their career. So for example, I don't think there's much point knowing how to manage a whole team of physios or worrying about that if you can't even assess a patient properly. Before I wrap up this video, I think it's really important to mention that every physio is on their own journey and every single person will have their own strengths and weaknesses. One person might have amazing clinical knowledge and one person might have amazing communication skills um, enabling them to build up a rapport and a, and a professional relationship faster. This level system is something that I've just completely made up and there's no science to back it. But from what I've seen, I've never seen any kind of content like this summarizing the different stages of a physiotherapist and what skills they will need along the journey. So that's why I've made this video, so I hope you kind of visualize what those skills are and maybe what you might need to work on 
depending on what stage of your career you are at. There are, ultimately, there are so many skills that make up a great MSK physiotherapist. So if I've missed something, which I probably have done, please mention it down below in the comments. If you've enjoyed this video, then you might also enjoy the video I did here, where I talk about how you can pass your physiotherapy university interview. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you there. Adios, amigos.